Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Hello and good night. Welcome, everybody. Please do take seats. Um, Welcome, good evening on this 1st of April. I hope you all survived the bloody practical jokes of your colleagues today. If not, um, let me console you with uh, the first famous quote of tonight's protagonist, namely, the greatest lesson in life is to know that even fools are right sometimes. My name is Sophie Derks, I'm a journalist. I've written for the Dutch weekly Vrij Nederland, more recently for The Correspondent. And I'm very pleased to guide you through tonight's programme, to this evening on the legacy of Sir Winston Churchill. Interesting to see that you're a predominantly male audience. I'm just curious what that what does tell, what tells us uh, about uh, this legacy, Mr. Roberts. Interesting. Um, let's see. Um, Though already more than a thousand of Churchill biographies have been written, um, last October, our special and honoured guest tonight, Mr. Andrew Roberts, historian and writer, decided that he too would publish his biography of Churchill, subtitled Walking with Destiny. The book almost immediately became a bestseller. Uh, it was translated into numerous languages, including the Dutch language, bearing the modest title Churchill de biographie. In the second part of this program, um, we'll be joined by Dutch-American historian Felix Kloss, and we'll focus on Churchill in relation to the current situation in Europe. But first, I'll give the floor to Mr. Andrew Roberts, um, visiting professor at the War Studies Department at King's College in London and at Stanford University. He teaches at the New York Historical Society and he's written numerous books, historical books, um, major works of history such as Masters and Commanders, 2008, The Story of War, 2009, and he already wrote, amongst others, um, a biography of Napoleon. Last four years, he's been uh, contributing almost all of his time to Winston Churchill, and we're very pleased that tonight he'll start with giving us a short introduction on his biography. Andrew Roberts. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to address you this evening, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Sophie, for those uh, kind words. I'd like to speak about Winston Churchill's sense of destiny. It was on the 10th of May, Friday the 10th of May, that Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, 10th of May 1940. And um, earlier, in, and it happened in the evening when uh, King George VI appointed him at Buckingham Palace to be Prime Minister. And on the evening of that, uh, of that day, this took place. In the morning, Adolf Hitler had unleashed Blitzkrieg on the West, invading um, Holland and, uh, and Belgium and also uh, Luxembourg. And later, of course, was also to invade France. And he was... Um, Winston Churchill was later to say of that uh, momentous day in European history that um, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour 
and for this trial. And what I've tried to do in this, uh, in this book, um, this enormous, magnificent book that uh, has um, uh, always display the product, um, that has been um, uh, published so, uh, so splendidly, um, is to try to look into, to investigate, to unpack that whole concept of, um, of Churchill's sense of destiny. He had a driving sense of destiny. It also looks at this idea of being all his past life having been a preparation for the hour and the trial of 1940. He had been Chancellor of the Exchequer, Home Secretary, the First Lord of the Admiralty in both the First World War and the Second World War in charge of the Royal Navy. He'd been in the First World War Minister of Munitions in charge of two and a half million um, workers in the munitions factories. But, at the, but, but really, and so of course his past life had indeed been a preparation for this, but also I look at the beginning part of that sentence, the bit about walking with destiny, because he believed, it's, I think it's impossible to understand Winston Churchill without appreciating that he believed that he had a driving sense of personal destiny. When he was 16 years old, a schoolboy at Harrow School in England, he told his best friends that he thought that in his lifetime, their lifetimes, there would be terrible upheavals, great struggles, and that he would be called upon to save London and save England. And he, he had this sense from 16 year, uh, years onwards, and what underlined this sense of his personal destiny was the extraordinary number of close brushes with death that he had in his lifetime. He was born two months prematurely, which in Victorian England, of course, was itself a close brush with death. He was stabbed in the stomach uh, by a school friend at the age of 10. Clearly not a very good friend. Um, he was, at the age of 11, um, he nearly died of pneumonia. And on that occasion, the doctors administered brandy to the 11-year-old. <laughs> Um, both orally and rectally, uh, which you um, might have thought would have put you off brandy for life, but certainly didn't in Winston Churchill's case. He was nearly drowned at the age of um, 16 in Lake Geneva. He very nearly died in a house fire at the age of 18. He was um, involved in two plane crashes, three car crashes, and... Um, and uh, then that, of course, by the way, was only the peacetime brushes with death involved. He was also, he fought in no fewer than five campaigns on four continents. And um, he once said that uh, the most exhilarating thing in life was to be shot at without result. Um, and Churchill, therefore, had this sense that he was being saved for something special when he was... Uh, in his 20s, early 20s, he took part in the last great cavalry charge of the, um, of the uh, British Empire, um, where 25% of his units were killed or wounded. And then the following year, he, um, his armoured train was ambushed in the South African War, and there too, only two months, and where 34% of his uh, unit were killed or wounded. And two months later, he escaped from a prisoner of war camp and crossed 300 miles of enemy territory. And in the First World War, uh, when he was a lieutenant colonel on the front rank, um, front uh, line in, uh, in Belgium, in Plergstert in Belgium, he, was, um, uh, he, he left a dugout in the front line, and 15 minutes later, a German high-explosive shell killed, uh, came in, hit the dugout, and decapitated everyone inside. And on that occasion, he said that he felt that there were invisible wings that were beating above him. And so he had this tremendous sense, actually, the invisible wings, he was not a Christian. He, um, he never mentioned the word Jesus Christ in the 5.1 million words that he spoke, or the 2.6 uh, million words that he wrote, but nonetheless, uh, he did believe in an almighty, although theologically, when you look into it carefully, the sole duty of the almighty was to look after Winston Churchill. 
But what this did do, um, ladies and gentlemen, was to give him a, a sense of destiny, which meant that he was tremendously calm in all of the great um, moments of his life. He was able to, to uh, feel um, immense calm to the point that he would make jokes um, even at the most dangerous and perilous moments that my country has, uh, has ever faced in its, uh, in its long history. In uh, one of the confidence motions in the House of Commons in uh, 1941, he, uh, when he was being attacked about the A-22 tank, he, uh, which was useless, by the way, um, he said that the, when the defects and the teething troubles of the A-22 tank were apparent to all, it was appropriately rechristened the Churchill. And the reason that that joke works is that he understood he had teething troubles and defects of his own. He made endless mistakes in his life. Uh, he got so many things wrong. Women's suffrage, the gold standard, the abdication crisis, uh, the... Um, uh, the Dardanelles campaign. But the great thing was that he learned from his mistakes. He was one of those politicians who learned from his mistakes. And what we're going to be talking about later on is the things that, um, in this uh, great uh, European debate that uh, has uh, engulfed my country at the moment, um, the, imp the importance of learning from mistakes is going to obviously be one of the things that I think we're going to be discussing. And... Um, and uh, my God, are there enough mistakes that we can have to learn from. So, um, a, 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 to, to sum up, this man was, uh, as I hope I'm going to have more opportunity to, uh, to point out later, a man of tremendous moral as well as physical courage, a man who was able to learn from his mistakes, a man of, of extraordinary eloquence, um, great uh, eloquence, creating phrases that will live for as long as the English language uh, lives. A uh, great friend, of course, to the uh, Dutch people who he admired for their stout-heartedness and their bravery during the Second World War. Somebody who was a, um, uh, a believer in the, the great canons, the great stances, the great beliefs of Western civilization. And somebody who ultimately, when you l bring all those things together, especially with his eloquence and his capacity to increase the morale of the, of the, um, of the freedom-loving peoples of the world during the Second World War, over the radio, of course, to places like, uh, uh, like uh, this city, where um, Anne Frank right, famously wrote in her diary uh, how much she loved Winston Churchill, how much she... Uh, the, the enormous... Um, uh, sense that she got from listening to him over the radio that here was the, the personification of the voice of freedom. And also this sense, as I say, of eloquence. So just to conclude, um, I'd like to um, uh, tell you about when his private secretary, Jock Colville, said uh, to him that they had asked him how it was that he was able to create these phrases that, uh, that gave such morale to, uh, uh, to people during those dim and terribly dark days in uh, 1940 and 1941. And he said, well, actually, what you need to do is to have three things in particular. Um, you need to keep your sentences short. Um, don't have long... Uh, long phrases, long uh, subclauses. Keep your words short as much as possible uh, and use words that really go to the heart, uh, that appeal to the viscera of the, uh, the, the gut of the, um, of the listener. And, uh, and when you add all of these things together, this tremendous sense of, uh, of Winston Churchill's when it came to his, uh, his physical courage, his ability to learn from mistakes, his eloquence and so on. You have somebody who actually went further than even he had prescribed for himself as a 16-year-old schoolboy because he did not just save London and England, but actually he played an essential part in saving civilization itself. Thank you very much. I 
thought in terms of product placement, I'll place it here, right? Then people well, no, put it in the front there, go on. Oh, yes, of course, there we are. It's a bit heavy to wave with, so I'll just leave it there. Um, thank you very much. But for not heavy intellectually, that's the key thing. Good, the product <laughs> placement goes on and on tonight, as you uh, notice. Um, Ms. Roberts, you've been giving numerous interviews already today to Dutch journalists. So just for us as an audience to know what's the level that we have to be tonight, what was the smartest question that you got? Oh, <laughs> well, gosh, what a good question. Um, well, actually, funnily enough, the, the last gentleman that I spoke to has, had read about 50 biographies of Churchill, um, and, um, and, uh, which was a little bit nerve-wracking. There are, by the way, 1,009 biographies that have been published of Winston Churchill, so you can imagine how nerve-wracking it is to... Is that including your one? No, no, this is the 1,010th. Okay. Um, uh, and, um, and he wanted to know a particular sentence that Churchill came out with in May 1940 at a key moment where he was trying to persuade the war cabinet to carry on fighting against Hitler, even though there seemed to be no possible way that we could have won the Second World War. The Russians weren't in the war, the Americans weren't in the war, the um, Belgian, French and British armies, of course, had, uh, had uh, retreated from Dunkirk and crossed the evacuated back to England, and there seemed to be no way that we could ever win the war. And one of Churchill's arguments to the cabinet to carry on fighting against Hitler, which of course turned out to be absolutely the right thing to do and key to, to national survival, was that na he said that nations that went down fighting had a chance to come back again and ones that didn't, that, that tamely surrendered, did not have a chance to come back fighting again. And he wanted to know which nations Churchill was talking about. Did you and, know? Uh, well, do you know, funnily enough, the, the, one of the nations that I, um, that I presented to him was Holland. Because Holland, again and again, had been attacked. I mean, throughout the, the 15th, 16th, 17th century, uh, quite a lot of the 18th century, you were in the, f you were in the front line of all... It was, you know, it's not for nothing that Holland is called the cockpit of Europe when it comes to, to fighting. And yet you never went down and never... Uh, and never uh, collapsed or surrendered. So, so I think probably that Churchill might have been thinking about Holland when he made that statement to the war cabinet. Let's bully you with another famous quote, the one I used when opening this night. Um, greatest lesson in life is to know that even fools are right sometimes. It's, it's a quote you find circulating. If you Google April's Fool's Day and Churchill, that's how I found it. Um, just curious, you spent four years uh, studying, researching Churchill. This quote, for example, is it possible for you to say by heart it was said then and then in that context? Do you know? No, I think you've made it up. <laughs> I've I never heard it before. Ah, I've no. never heard it before, I'm afraid. And, and there, are, there are any number, there are thousands upon thousands of invented Churchill, Churchill quotes. quotes. That yeah. was why I wanted to check it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm, 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 I'm sorry. When, when you said it, I thought, hang on, I'm not so sure about that. I didn't but, invent it or... Maybe Google invented it's, it. Yeah, no, exactly. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to start... Um, um, oh, yeah, yeah, and we had this predominantly male audience that I noticed. I didn't want to... Uh, yeah, yeah. I haven't offended noticed anyone. That, I, do you know, funny enough, I'm looking around, all I can see is incredibly beautiful Dutch women, and I haven't noticed That's a, a single... Answer. I haven't see, uh, noticed a single man at all in the whole audience. The, Oh, maybe, yeah, OK, one or two, one or two. I was just curious, what does it tell us? I mean, is this your regular audience, and do you think it tells us something about Churchill's legacy? No, my so? regular audience is not incredibly beautiful Dutch women. I, I, I wish it were. Um, it, um, Churchill's a military, um, military figure. He, as I say, fought in five uh, wars. He was somebody who... Um, I think probably, um, hopefully, does actually appeal to, uh, to both sexes. When he set up his great uh, Churchill College in Cambridge, he insisted that um, it was the first Ch Oxbridge College to admit women uh, to, take, uh, to take degrees uh, on a completely equal basis to men. So, um, so if you're trying to make a point about feminism, I, it's no, not one I'm that I... No, absolutely not. Well, OK, well, it's not one that I, I, I spot particularly. Good. This um, institute you just mentioned, the Churchill Archives in, in Cambridge, 
It is the place where no fewer than 41 sets of papers have been deposited um, since the last biography before your one about Churchill has been written. And as I understood, this fact was also a reason for you to be able to write a, a new biography on Churchill. Can you tell us what did you find in those papers? And one wonders, of course, where did they come from all of a sudden? Yes, well, it, I mean, as we mentioned, there are 1,009 biographies. And so I worried about um, whether or not uh, there was going to be anything new to say about Churchill. And yet, in the, in the past six years or so, there has been an avalanche of new uh, sources about Churchill, really important ones. Um, the first was that Her Majesty the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diaries. And King George VI met Churchill every Tuesday of the Second World War, and they um, lunched together every Tuesday at Buckingham Palace. And um, the king was trusted by Churchill with all of the great secrets of the Second World War, the uh, nuclear secrets, the uh, enigma decrypt secrets, which ministers and generals were going to be hired and fired, which countries were going to be invaded, when and under what circumstances. And so what um, you have, therefore, from this source is an insight into Churchill's mind, because the king wrote down everything that Churchill said, for every Tuesday of the Second World War. Also, the 41 sets of papers that you mentioned include Churchill's daughter, Mary Soames' wartime diaries, um, people who worked with Churchill, uh, the diplomats um, who were uh, in the Foreign Office at the time, and so on. There has been the diaries of Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador from 1932 to 43, who saw Churchill on a very regular basis, especially during the Nazi-Soviet pact period, <coughs> I was very fortunate that the Churchill family also allowed me to use the papers of uh, Pamela Harriman, who was uh, Churchill's daughter-in-law, who had any number of, um, of love affairs in the Second World War while she was married to Churchill's son. And, um, and lots of people were writing love letters to her, which often mentioned Churchill, and that was very useful. And six years ago, I also... Uh, discovered the verbatim account of the war cabinet, the, the verbatim um, actual everything that they that they said in the uh, in the war cabinet. So we now know what every single person said during that period, and it was pure luck that I found it. I pref I'd love to pretend it was archival genius, but it wasn't. I just came across these papers. And, um, and managed to decipher the hieroglyphics and the shorthand to actually work out what, uh, what, it, what they were. And that also was an absolutely essential part of the jigsaw. So it does mean that, I, that in this book, um, pretty much every page has something that has never appeared in any of the 1009 biographies before. So far, the product placement, just, just a question, a serious question, if you should boil it down to one or two points, what is the most surprising thing that you've discovered? Obvious question, but um, curious. I think the most surprising thing was quite how, um, how frustrated and, and uh, irritated Churchill was by the incredibly slow movement of the Roosevelt administration getting America involved in the Second World War. Uh, he saw the war, uh, rightly, as a, as a um, great uh, Manichaean struggle between good and evil, between um, democracy and civilization on one side, and the horror of uh, the most evil uh, regime in history on the other. And so he couldn't understand why the most powerful democracy in the world, um, the United States, was not getting more involved. Because, of course, he understood about the power of the isolationist element and America first and that. But nonetheless, he thought that Roosevelt ought to be moving things faster. But he couldn't tell the press or the public or any um, of the... Um, of the of, of, couldn't, certainly couldn't mention it in, in Parliament. Um, because it would, of course, uh, ignite the American isolationist feeling. So the only person he could talk to was the king, because he trusted the king implicitly. 
And, and, and so he does, and, that, and that's what came out. And I should have intuitively understood that that was the sense, but I hadn't read it in any of these books, and, I, and, I, and, and so it came as a surprise when I read it. Because I remember the movie Darkest Hour, right? The most recent Churchill uh, movie, 2018, I believe, where mm. we see a phone call Churchill's making to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt suggesting that he could use horses to get his fighting planes in time uh, over the border at Canada or something. So this frustration is, is in this movie as well. And what is also in this movie is this relationship with King George VI um, in the movie being displayed as if they really became friends in the end. Is that what they, you've yes. found as well? Um, they, they did become friends, um, which they didn't necessarily... It wasn't necessarily predestined that they were going to because uh, Churchill, of course, had supported the king's elder brother, King Edward VIII, during the abdication crisis. The beginning was very difficult uh, of the relationship. Absolutely. And also, the king had been a firm and staunch supporter of Neville Chamberlain and the policy of appeasement. And so it's perfectly possible that they wouldn't have got on. But very quickly, during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, they did get on um, extremely well. And, um, and so it, uh, it worked extremely well. By the way, with regard to The Darkest Hour, which is a wonderful movie, and I love it, uh, and I think that Gary Oldman uh, played uh, Churchill brilliantly, and that look in his eye and the glint and, and the smile and the chuckle, it, was, it caught him superbly. But the idea that um, King George VI turned up to Winston Churchill's bedroom at number 10 Downing Street at midnight <laughs> in order to ask him to go onto the underground to find out what ordinary people thought of fighting on against Hitler is, um, is completely ludicrous. I already assumed that that scene would not be found in your bio biography. <laughs> Another problem um, when you're facing a Churchill biography, apart from the fact that thousands of people have done it before you, um, is of course the fact that Churchill himself has written down his life and career um, very uh, elaborately already. Um, how did you relate as a biography to these sources? Um, how did you prevent that you repeat the story Churchill wanted to tell about himself? Well, you have to check all the, um, all the things, stories that he did want to tell about himself. And uh, Churchill, of course, I mean, he, he started writing that biography only three years after the war had, had ended. He wasn't keeping notes of everything that he was saying and doing all the way through. He managed even to, on the, uh, about the, the day that they chose him to be the prime minister, he managed to get the day wrong, the time wrong, and the number of people in the room wrong, um, which uh, you know, it, was, it, was, it was four people rather than the three. That's the kind of thing that you, you tend, tend not to get wrong. But nonetheless, um, there are, uh, and of course there are books about, about Churchill's mistakes, endless books about Churchill's errors in his, uh, in his memory. But overall, considering that, uh, that he was writing it almost immediately afterwards, um, and with uh, a, a lot of, I mean, there's a, there's a, I'm sure this happens with, with uh, pretty much everyone, is that um, once anecdotes get told about stories that of, of, of in, in your life, you tend to, um, to exaggerate them slightly, they tend to grow like barnacles attaching to the bottom of a boat. A well, a well sailed story will attach uh, more and more um, barnacles. And, um, and actually, I, overall, I think it's remarkable how accurate his, um, his memoirs were. Yes, there were mistakes. But overall, he was telling his story. He was not attempting to give an objective history of the Second World War. He was, he was telling his own uh, story. And by and large, when you check it against the original sources and the other people who were involved, he was not exaggerating in anything like the way that an awful lot of other politicians do. Hmm. Modesty. No, just the knowledge that he'd been an essential figure in helping win the Second World War, so he didn't, he didn't need to show off terribly much. Your book is called Walking with Destiny, and you confirm Churchill's idea that his whole life has been preparing for this particular role that you just described during the Second World War. Um, that said, has the Second World War indeed been the most important period of his life, according to you? And if so, do you think that Churchill believed that he has accomplished anything of importance afterwards? Um, yes, um, it, it obviously was the most important thing because the threat posed by Hitler was the most grave 
grave threat of, uh, of the 20th century in his life. Um, so he, he understood that uh, immediately. But what he also, of course, was managed to do almost immediately after the Second World War on the uh, 5th of March 1946, so within a, war, within a year of that war ending, he gave the famous Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, um, in which he warned about Stalin and the danger of uh, Soviet communism, especially in Eastern Europe. And that was a tremendously unpopular speech to give. He was, uh, he was attacked, he was lambasted in the press, both in Britain and America. He was attacked in both Congress and uh, Parliament. And he stuck out, um, just as he had in before the Second World War with regard to warning against uh, Hitler and the Nazis, um, and it wasn't until a couple of years later, really, that uh, events proved that he was right and that all of these people in the press and, and, uh, and in Parliament and uh, amongst the public were wrong and that uh, Stalin was indeed a, a, a danger to the um, balance of power in Europe. Mm -hmm. When I hear you talk, a certain admiration for your subject is clear, I guess, although you've already mentioned that, of course, you also mentioned the, the misjudgments, the, the catastrophic Terrible mistakes, errors, one as after the other, them. after the other. Blunders. Yeah. Blunders. Mm. And, and still, um, do you agree with the iconic status he has been given? Uh, yes, I do. Oh, no, absolutely. I think, uh, I think because of his warnings, about the, um, the danger of Prussian militarism before the First World War and Hitler and the Nazis and uh, Stalin. He got the big three things right in the 20th century. And yes, of course, he got any number of things wrong. The gold standard, the abdication crisis, the black and tans in Ireland, uh, the Gallipoli campaign. This huge campaign in the First World War which was to cost the lives um, of tens of thousands of people. He was the, the, chief, um, the chief man for that. He was also the chief scapegoat, of course, when it went wrong. Um, he, uh, we mentioned earlier, women's suffrage. He got a lot of things badly wrong. But as he said to his wife in January 1916, um, I should have made nothing if I had not made mistakes. And I think the mistakes he made were trivial compared to the things that he got right, which were, of course, these three key aspects of the 20th century. Mm. Um, interesting, of course, uh, let's, let's zoom in a bit on, on how society nowadays remembers Churchill, um, the figure of Churchill. I, I read, of course, there's this BBC survey of uh, where he's displayed the greatest Britain, where he pipped Shakespeare, Elizabeth I, and Princess Diana. Diana. <laughs> um, to the post, and in another poll of school ch children, interestingly enough, some 20% of them decided he was a fictional character. Um, you chaired, I read, the Conservative Party's advisory panel on the teaching of history in schools in 2005. Um, what went wrong? What should all British school children know about Churchill, in your well, opinion? Well, they, they, they should be taught um, about him. At the moment, the, uh, the entire syllabus, um, history syllabus, uh, a child can get through the whole way through the British history syllabus and only learn about Winston Churchill for 14 seconds. That's how long he is on a video that, uh, that needs to be, that is shown in British schools, which is, uh, in my view, completely monstrous and absurd because he was the greatest Englishman. Um, and so to, to try to, um, to narrow down our, our um, our greatest Englishman to 14 seconds is is unbelievable. Um, we, you, you, when you mentioned the sur the survey about 20% of children think that British children think that he's a fictional character. Um, by the way, 47% think that Sherlock Holmes is a real person, um, and 53% think that Eleanor Rigby uh, is a real person as well. So clearly something needs to be done about our educational, um, uh, certainly the history syllabus at least. For a long time, uh, Churchill has been almost invaluable, I think. I, I mean, he... he Recently, he's been criticised more and more, even in Britain. Even this greatest Britain got more and more criticism. For example, um, let's say, on his colonial leadership and his actions, for example, in India. Um, can you describe this criticism and how you 
Rigatis as an historian? Yes, well, of course he's been criticised an awful lot more um, uh, now than he was during his, uh, during his lifetime, when people were still alive who, who remember what he did. Um, the internet has been a huge area of, um, of uh, criticism. Uh, of course, there's an awful lot of sort of just sheer strange, mad, nutty stuff about how he was responsible for sinking the Titanic um, and, uh, and various stuff like that. Um, and the Lusitania as well, uh, apparently, he sank that too. Um, he was accused quite recently in, uh, uh, of being a non-smoker, uh, which, considering that he smoked 160,000 cigars in his life, um, it was also a bit strange. Um, but on the serious side, he's also been criticised and, and accused of being responsible for genocide in India at the time of the Bengal famine in 1943. And this has been something that has been picked up, especially by uh, Indian politicians and uh, Hindu nationalist politicians in particular, as being, um, as being true. It is not true. I... I, I um, have six pages of this book going into the um, the way in which the Bengal famine happened, the uh, mistakes that undoubtedly were made, both by the provincial councils, which were uh, run by Indians at that stage, but also by the um, government in, in Calcutta, and also um, other mistakes. But the idea that Winston Churchill was in any way responsible for a genocide is completely wrong and, um, thank you, and, uh, and in fact absurd. Um, he's accused of gassing in, um, Iraqi tribesmen um, in the 1920s. And when you actually go back, and what you always have to do with these, with these uh, attacks on him, is to go back and to see the extent in the original papers that it's, um, that it's justified and the extent to which it isn't. And with the Iraqi um, tribesmen, actually, when you go and see the original papers at Churchill College, Cambridge, which you mentioned earlier, where all his papers are, in fact, he was advocating the use of what's called lacrimotary gas, tear gas, completely different from, from mustard gas or chlorine gas or phosgene gas or any of the actual um, lethal gases. He was basically saying that these people should be tear gassed in exactly the same way that uh, Emmanuel Macron is tear gassing the um, gilets jaunes. Mm. You know, that is not, that is not uh, mass murder. It's very important all the time to look at these, um, at these original sources and to work out what genuinely actually happened. But the general bigger question behind all this, of course, is our interpretation of history changes over time. Uh, would you say it's wrong in that light to interpret Churchill's actions with our contemporary values and standards when it comes, for example, to this colonial time? Well, with regard to colonialism, um, yes, it's... Uh, it's really absurd to try and treat uh, somebody who was born in 1874, who grew up at the same time that Charles Dar Darwin um, was still alive, um, when at the time they believed in a hierarchy of races, which today we know to be ludicrous and obscene. But at the time they thought that it was scientific fact. And so to, um, to try to um, attack somebody in a, in a kind of modern politically correct way for something that they at the time considered, that everybody considered to be scientifically uh, uh, factual, I think is ridiculous. It's like trying to accuse, I don't know, William of Orange or William the Silent of, um, of being an evil person because he didn't believe in socialised medicine. It doesn't make any sense at all. Your book has been published a couple of months ago in the UK that has been polarised as never before in this Brexit issue. Do you think that um, that has influenced the receptance of the book in a way? Um, well, actually, funny enough, it um, yes, it came out at the end of 2018. So by that stage, the, the Brexit battle had already been going on for two years. Um, Churchill was brought up during the Brexit battle a lot for reasons that I'm sure we're going to discuss with Felix in a few don't moments. Don't go into that uh, subject too deep yet. Don't no. want to, don't want to, don't want to uh, uh, shoot any foxes, as we say in England. Um, but, um, but no, the, uh, the reception has been extraordinary. It's, uh, 
it has um, not been attacked because of anything that I say about Churchill and Europe in this, because um, first of all, that's only about 10 pages in a thousand. Um, and also, I have been rigorous in ensuring that um, I approach this in that, that issue in a uh, entirely um, historically objective way. Why is it only 10 pages? Because it's not that important. I, I know it sounds important, and we're sitting here now, but Churchill um, did not wake up every morning thinking, what am I going to do about, um, about Britain in Europe? Marvellous point, I guess, to introduce our second guest of tonight. Thank you very much for handing me this little bridge. Um, Felix Kloss, let me introduce you first and then I'll ask you uh, uh, on stage. Um, Dutch-American historian, he studied European history in Oxford and political sciences in Vermont. After his studies, he worked for the campaign team of, amongst others, Hillary Clinton in Iowa and as a speechwriter and spokesman for Alexander Pechtold, the former leader of D66, D66. Currently, he is a candidate for the European Parliament for D66, and he also wrote a book on Churchill. I hope he brought his book for some product placement as well. He didn't, <laughs> uh, Felix. At least I'll tell you then the title, Churchill, Father of Europe. That was the Dutch title, and interestingly enough, in English, it's called Churchill's Last Stand, the struggle to unite Europe, to, to, the struggle to unite Europe, sorry. Um, well, let's have him on stage. Felix Kloss. <laughs> Maybe starting with this difference in titles first. Did you, was it too risky to call Churchill the European father in the English version? Uh, no, but it has something to do, I think, with product placement or at least product popularity. Uh, my British publisher, as well as my American publisher, thought it would be more interesting to have a book about Churchill, first of all, and then about Europe. Um, I think it's interesting that the Portuguese version, I would have liked that to be the English title translated back into it, was Uniting Europe, Churchill's Last Stand. And that would have made more sense, I think, in this dark hour for our continent. <laughs> Maybe you should briefly uh, take us uh, into your own fascination for this statement and, and please tell us where did you find the need and the courage to write another book about <laughs> Churchill? Because yours, I guess, is then number one... 1011. <laughs> no, his came out before mine. Ah, right. Maybe 1, mine doesn't count. I don't, know, I don't know how you did it in the calculations, but mine is more so a, a partial biography, right? It's about a, a specific part of Churchill's life and a specific part of his thinking and his um, ideas world. Um, my fascination with Churchill stems from, from Europe, really. Uh, I was uh, inquiring into the origins of the European project, why the European Union exists and why all of these courageous men and women did something after the Second World War and not just before it or during it. And I discovered, or maybe discovered is not the right word, I started reading about Winston Churchill and his role in uh, the late 1940s in bringing about this idea of European unity. Because after the Second World War, he didn't win his election in 1945. He lost. Uh, and he was looking for another purpose something he said in 1945 that he wanted to do for a long time, which was not just to win the war, but to win the peace. And to win the peace, Europe had to be united. We'll talk about Britain's role uh, in that project, and I think there, the church has some ambivalence towards uh, uh, whether he wanted Britain to be in a federation or in a union or all of these difficult conceptual issues. But my interest in Churchill came originally from studying the history of European integration. Yeah, actually, yeah. You, you mentioned somewhere that this was a forgotten history in your perception. Forgotten uh, history when you studied in Oxford, you find out how, in your opinion, um, uh, how such an advocate Churchill was for the European project. Yeah, well, it's not entirely forgotten because most biographies spend a perfunctory paragraph or a chapter. Or at least 10 pages. Uh, at least 10 pages of a thousand uh, uh, on Churchill's engagement with the idea of Europe. Um, I think it's one of the most fascinating parts of his life, and it's worth writing a full book about, not quite a thousand pages, maybe just 450 or so. About this book that you've been written, uh, you've, the two of you have Your debated. book isn't 450 pages, is it? It is, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's really you thought it was Only 27, but I can still write words. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Um, the two gentlemen, you've already been debating about your book 
Felix, uh, before, uh, but this is the first debate on Dutch soil, so don't worry, you still have a premier here tonight. Um, <laughs> just in, in terms of, of getting clear where you guys dis differ in, in terms of this European legacy of Churchill, I would suggest that we take a look at some speeches uh, from Churchill, some historical footage that we have prepared for you. Can we see it? Can we hear it? cannot aim at anything less than the Union of Europe as a whole. And we look forward with confidence to the day when that union will be achieved. If Europe were once united in the sharing of its common inheritance, there would be no limit to the happiness, to the prosperity and the glory which its three or four hundred million people would enjoy. We must recreate the European family in a regional structure called, it may be, the United States of Europe. And the first practical step would be to form a Council of Europe. We must all turn our backs upon the horrors of the past. We must look to the future. We cannot afford to drag forward across the years that are to come the hatreds and revenges which have sprung from the injuries of the past. Okay, this was partly a, a horror test, uh, um, an additional test, so maybe I would give you, Felix, first the opportunity to tell us what, in, in brief lines, that we hear and why is it so important, in your opinion, to yeah. know these words of Churchill considering right. Europe? It's important because Churchill here was speaking after the war, and uh, this was a period in history which was difficult for Europe, to say the least. People were starving, um, refugees all around the continent, uh, and when uh, he made a speech at Zurich in 1946, with most of this footage is from Zurich, the Nuremberg trials were still going on. Uh, so for him to say that we must now bury our revenges, our hatreds, and work together, uh, was something revolutionary for the European continent, even though the idea of European unity was much older than the year 1946 itself. It's important because he's urging France and Germany to bury the hatchets. It's important because he's telling the small states that they will have a place in the world after losing their sovereignty in the Second World War. And, and this is the point where I think we differ, but, but we'll get into this, is it's important because he's struggling with the idea of where Britain would be in the world after the Second World War. He's an imperialist by heart. Uh, he's a natural uh, uh, transatlanticist. He loves the United States and wants to build a relationship with the United States. But he's also a good European, as he often called himself. And he's trying to find a place for Britain at the helm of these three great power circles, the relationship between Britain and the United States, the relationship between Britain and empire, as it then still existed, and the Commonwealth, and then the relation between Britain and what he started calling a united Europe, a European Union, or even, as we just heard him say, the United States of Europe. Actually, you said you published this pamphlet uh, at the time of the European referendum stating, I am in no doubt that Churchill wanted an ever closer union of European states. That's right. More than that, I argue, he wanted Britain to play a leading part. Churchill came to the conclusion that Britain's future lay in Europe. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we give Mr. Um, Roberts the, the chance to, to respond, why are you so sure that this is what Churchill meant? Uh, because I went back to the papers, I took Andrew's advice, uh, and, um, and when writing, uh, read everything that Churchill said about this specific subject, uh, went into his uh, speeches, but also into his personal papers, into his personal letters, and it's interesting to trace his thinking about Britain and Europe, because before the Second World War, he is convinced that there should be a federal union of European states, uh, which Britain would not play a part in whatsoever, uh, um, apart from being just a sponsor and a friend. Uh, definitely not absorbed, definitely not comprised, as he said it, uh, but, but a, a merely a sponsor. And then the war changed something. So he started talking in 1942 about a Council of Europe, not quite a European Union or United States of Europe, but a Council of European States, 
uh, that would be the main channel from which all else flowed. And so in 1946, after he gave this speech, he wrote a piece in The Telegraph. Uh, its title was United Europe, One Way to Stop War. And he set out four things that this Council of Europe should do. One, it was to be an uh, economic harmony as a stepping stone to economic unity. It had to reach some form of common defense, which in 1950 he would call a European army, to which most people thought he would have liked to be the minister of defense. Then the third was postage stamps, then still relevant in Europe, <laughs> European postage stamps. And the fourth was, of course, a common coin, which he also proposed uh, for Britain and the United States to have. So he was thinking very broadly in these days. Um, my point being, Churchill wanted Britain to be part of the Council of Europe. This, we, we agree on this point. And the problem of federation or union in the, in the sort of future of the 2010s and the 2020s was definitely theoretical for him. But as he always said, he was uh, planting a seed, growing a tree. He was looking at the embers and waiting for them uh, to, to change into a blaze, into a big fire. But he knew that his life was ending and that it would be for further generations to develop the idea. Mr. Roberts, sounds convincing, one would think, but in uh, your review of the book of Felix Kloss, you wrote that his, his central premise is all wrong, in fact. Why? Um, because Br Churchill never wanted Britain to be part of it. He was very much in favour of a united Europe. Of course he was. He had lost so many friends in the First World War, so many in the Second World War. As he said, I never want to see a Teuton fight Gaul. He said, we must bury the thousand-year hatred between France and Germany. And so, of course, and this, this by the way, uh, as, uh, as Felix said, predated the Second World War. Um, in the 1930s, he was uh, close to people who were thinking about this. Um, but when it actually came to uh, the great speeches that he gave in The Hague, in Strasbourg, in Zurich, and so on, um, at no stage in any of those did he say that um, that the United Kingdom should be a member of this. And also at no stage when he, uh, in fact, later in December 1948, he went out of his way to distance himself from any of this kind of uh, talk of, of uh, Britain being involved. And this was before he became Prime Minister. When he actually was Prime Minister, between October 1951 and April 1955, so only two years before the Treaty of Rome um, started the European Economic Community, he stopped, again and again, he stopped Britain from going down those bilateral and multilateral routes that were the precursors of the European Economic Community, the European Army, as uh, Felix mentioned, the Iron and Steel Confederation. Now, that's a very important aspect of Europe because, of course, it's iron and steel that um, was needed in order for France ever to fight Germany again. And because he was uh, very much in favour of them going to, coming together and also of the, uh, of the Treaty of Rome uh, and the accession of, uh, of Italy and Benelux and so on in the really early development, had he wanted um, the United Kingdom to uh, be part of that, he'd have said so, and he'd have done something. He was prime minister uh, of a majority conservative government. Those were the old days when, when conservatives had majority governments. Um, and he did nothing at all to, do, to, to bring this forward. In fact, he wrote, um, he wrote um, minutes and, uh, and uh, memoranda, especially in November 1951, saying that he did not want this to happen. And so it is, um, it's 95% of what uh, Felix says is absolutely right, and I agree wholeheartedly with it. The 5%, however, that he gets wrong, he manages to get completely wrong, and therefore I think it's okay to, uh, to mention that. And if you'd like quotations, obviously, from the 1948 speech, 1951 uh, memorandum, I'd be tremendously pleased to give them to you. Felix, is it the first time you hear this being told to you? So are you having any doubts already about your own theory? No, or? no, I think I, Andrew is just, um, just a little bit conceptually confused, I think, which is um, understandable uh, given the, uh, 
<laughs> continental inclination to logical thinking. Um, <laughs> Are you saying that Winston Churchill is a continental with logical thinking? Yes, he, he loved France. I think he was more of a logical thinker than Anglo-Saxon, yeah. But go on, you're, um, not, you're not convinced yet. No, I'm not convinced in that sense. I think, I think we, we do agree part of the way. Um, 95%. I, 95%. Um, the problem where, this, this is where we, where we differ, I think, is Andrew's totally right to say that Churchill did not want Britain comprised in a federation in 1950, or in 1951, or any of the other years of his second premiership until 1955. The problem was, he was running with an idea that was different. He called it United Europe, or European Union. And when in 1950, we came to the point where the French and the Germans had taken the idea away from Churchill, basically said, okay, thank you so much for the inspiration, now we'll put this into uh, concrete measures, that should lead to a federation immediately. And it was a combination, as Andrew rightly says, of a European coal and steel community, which would make war materially impossible, and a European army complete with a political union. That's when Churchill said, OK, I'm sorry, but I was born in 1874. Uh, I have my empire and my commonwealth. And this would limit British power in a way that I think is unacceptable. And I think that's historically completely understandable. But what he did do in 1950 was he went to the House of Commons in a two-day debate on whether Britain should join the negotiations for the Schuman Plan, which was the origin of the European Union. And he made what I think is the most remarkable speech uh, in his later life. He referred to the soldiers that went to the front, to the mothers that wept for their sons, and he said, we didn't fight this war just for ourselves, but for mankind. And the conservative and liberal parties declare, because he was speaking for both, that national sovereignty is not inviolable. Not inviolable. That it is viable that we can give up national sovereignty to join the institutions of the future. Because Britain's place in the world will be dependent on having power stemming from Europe as well as from the Commonwealth and from empire. Now this is all, I mean, this is hair splitting, right? This is, it, it comes down to words, but I think it's important because he does this in his speech in The Hague as well in 1948. He says, of course, being part of the Council of Europe, which can grow into something much more in the future, will involve uh, abdicating sovereignty. So the question is, should we listen to his words or look at his deeds? No, that is exactly the question. <laughs> when I and can I also point yeah. out that we had, up until, by 1950, we had already accepted, the Conservative Party had already accepted that sovereignty was viable because we had joined NATO by that stage. In April 1949, we had joined NATO, which of course ultimately is the thing that has saved peace in, uh, in Europe since uh, the Second World War. And therefore, there was no great um, ideological uh, problem or, or divide or issue here by the time in 1950 that, uh, that these uh, statements were made. Where Churchill, in, uh, by that stage, was coming under extreme attack, not from the nationalists or the nativists or the reactionaries or the conservatives even, but from the actual people in the European movement itself, like Gladwin Jebb, uh, Lord Sherfield, and others, um, was that he was not willing to go further towards um, European um, federation, integration, and so on. And he was actually coming under attack from people who did want to go that far. And that in itself strikes me as indicative of the um, way in which uh, Felix is exaggerating the um, extent to which Churchill was willing to go. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I I'd like to pick you up on two things. First, as you say, uh, it was NATO that settled peace in Europe and it was not the European Union. Yeah. Uh, I think that's naive. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a comment that comes from uh, a generation, maybe all of us here from different generations, that have stood under an umbrella, and, uh, uh, and it's been uh, completely dry this entire time, uh, and we wonder, well, why isn't it wet? I mean, has the European Union anything to do with it? If Churchill wrote in 1946 an article which he himself titled, United Europe, one way to stop a new war, then wouldn't you say that Churchill 
is saying that you're wrong about this point. No, because most of European countries join NATO. And this was the great thing about NATO in, uh, in April 1949, actually predated the European Union by eight years. Um, and as you, uh, as you pointed out, um, it was dry all the time. It was dry all the time in those eight years, too. That's right, because the European Union, of course, started in 1950 with the European coal and steel community, which, by binding together coal and steel, the materials to make war, which the French and the Germans had done three times over in 70 years, it made war materially impossible. The, sorry, the most, the most likely war that was going to take place between 1945 and 1965 was with Russia. Of course. Not, not between France and Germany. And the thing that, um, that kept Russia out and America in was NATO, not the European Union. So NATO was incredibly important to European peace, but I, just, I think this point is really important because it's both. It's not just one. And there's a reason, I think, why uh, the Nobel Prize was given to the European Union in 2012, because uh, it was... The and has never been given to NATO, by the way, <laughs> which is a genuine organisation which Felix, saves last peace. point on this one. Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, the, uh, the, I've forgotten the other point. I thought this point was so important. <laughs> Good. That, that, those are the best points in debates, um, the ones you forget. Just uh, let me pick up this, this ambiguity that you see in, in Churchill's legacy on how he thought on, on Europe, for example, um, that caused, of course, enabled, of course, the Brexit both Brexit campaigns, Leave and Remain, to use Churchill uh, as a figure for their own cause. I was just curious, how do you both think of this? I mean, has Churchill been misused in a way? Starting with you. Um, well, he's been misused a bit by Felix in the no, last... No, I'm talking about the Brexit it, no, debate. No, but, no, but it, he brought out his little pamphlet just yes. before Brexit. You're right. So, and, uh, and actually, it was the only... I think I'm right in saying the only pamphlet that mentions... Uh, that makes a, a factor of Churchill in the Brexit uh, debate. It was, sure. uh, it was brought out before the referendum. Uh, it was a... Uh, uh, it was plugged by The Guardian very, um, uh, very extensively. And so we do have here someone who was one of the great and most uh, powerfully eloquent propagandists for Remain. Um, and so I think it's perfectly reasonable if I was to question him. Uh, and, and you even referred to my review of that, uh, of that book. And that final line about how he believes that Churchill um, wanted Britain to, uh, to join the European project, I think is fundamentally wrong. Um, because of the remarks that he made in uh, opposition, and also because of the actions that he took in government. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just this question very bluntly. Is it possible to interpret Churchill's views both in favour and against Brexit? Or is it, can it only be used for one political side? Well, first of all, let's, let's be sort of grown up about this. Winston Churchill died in 1965 and Brexit took place. Uh, hasn't taken place at all, but the, uh, the <laughs> referendum... We and yet, might well maybe. not take place, but the referendum took place in 2016, half a century later. And uh, Winston Churchill's daughter, Mary Soames, told me um, never to assume that you know what Papa would have said. Winston Churchill was a very mercurial figure. He crossed the House of Commons, the floor of the House of Commons, not once, but twice. Um, and so we cannot know what a dead person would have thought about anything. Um, but when it comes to the, um, to, as I say, the, the actions he took and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the minutes and the memoranda that he wrote and the way in which he again and again avoided mentioning Britain as joining this thing in any of these great speeches that he gave, it strikes me that um, and there are lesser other examples, uh, such as what he said to Montgomery. Admittedly, his mind was, was uh, sadly going by then, but nonetheless, he told Montgomery that uh, he didn't want Britain to join the European Economic Community in 1961. His daughter uh, says that's wrong, right? Montgomery it, 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 extrapolated his words. His, yeah. his daughter, yeah. not just his daughter, but all of the Remainers, um, his daughter's wife, uh, sorry, his daughter's husband, and also Duncan Sands, mm -hmm. very quickly put pressure on the private secretary to, um, to, write a letter. To, to write a letter to say that that's not true. When I had lunch with the private secretary, he, um, and indeed I think he says in his autobiography that he came under a lot of pressure to do that. 
the private secretary wasn't there, the daughter wasn't there, neither of the sons-in-law were there, but Montgomery was. Um, and so uh, you can take it either way. The key thing is, at no point does he actually say, I want Britain to join the European project. I can see and feel that you as an audience have been listening over an hour. You want to ha ask your own questions. I'll be with you within a minute. Just um, finally, let me ask you, Mr. Um, Roberts, you have been writing um, what might have been a collection of 12 what-if essays written by distinguished historians. So let's just bring up this what-if. What would Churchill make of the current political situation in the UK since you brought it up? The great thing about what might have been uh, books is they're very easy to write owing to the fact that you don't have to do any historical research. Um, and, uh, and what I think Churchill would do at the moment were he parachuted in fully you know, alive and conscious into a safe seat in the Conservative Party at the moment would be to hold his head in his hands. And uh, he burst into tears some... 50 times during the Second World War. He was a very rem uh, rem emotional figure, passionate figure. And he'd certainly be spending a lot of time um, crying. crying at the moment, yes. Oh, I but think that's, so, yeah. that's uh, no, no, tragedy no, no. for no, us. Not really, because, um, because, as I say, he was an emotional figure. He, he burst into tears very easily. Um, but he would have come up with a solution, wouldn't he? He would burst into tears, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing we can agree on. <laughs> So no solutions from the side of church? Look, w not from where we are at the moment. I mean, had he become prime minister in 2016, um, then he might have actually worked out a, uh, a, a plan to deal with this. The idea that uh, he would have spent nearly three years, as Mrs May has done, uh, getting to the point that we are now is something that I do not believe would have happened under the leadership of pretty much anyone. Um, <laughs> Uh, let alone uh, Theresa May. We're waiting for biography of Theresa May, I guess. Um, Not audience. by me. <laughs> I was afraid so. Yes, I, I come up to you. Uh, and please keep in mind, where I, I wrote it down, this, this lovely phrase of uh, Mr Churchill, keep your sentences short. Appeal is that when it gets to, gut of the, to the gut of the listeners. So be short, please. Um, Theo Kralt, I have a question about uh, the biography you've also written about uh, Halifax. And my question is, uh, what do you think would have happened if Halifax would have become Prime Minister in 1940 instead of Churchill? Yeah, That's a very please elaborate a bit on who he was, right? My yes, Lord, Lord Halifax was the Foreign everyone. Secretary who became... Um, who nearly became Prime Minister, who was the only alternative to Churchill on the 9th of May 1940, the day before Churchill became Prime Minister. And of course, by the end of that month, he was in favour of having a negotiated peace with Adolf Hitler. And he, um, it was, in many ways, the logical, rational thing to do. America wasn't in the war, Russia wasn't in the war, uh, the Belgians, British, and had been, uh, were in the process of... Uh, of evacuating from Dunkirk, there seemed to be no way that we could win that war. And so uh, c coming to some kind of peace arrangement was the logical and rational thing to do. Thankfully, we had a, in a Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who was deeply illogical and irrational and romantic figure, as I mentioned, who was driven by his passions and by a sense of history and not by uh, logic and rationality. What would have happened, I think, is that we would have made that peace with, uh, with Hitler. Hitler would then have invaded, at a time of his own choosing, the Soviet Union. He would have been able to have used 100% of the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe to have done that. He would have got, uh, as it was, of course, he got up to Leningrad and subjected Leningrad to a gruelling thousand-day siege in which cannibalism broke out at one point. There was, uh, he got to the underground stations of, subway stations of... Moscow, and he captured, down in the south, he captured Stalingrad. Ha and he did that with 70% of his forces. Had he had all of them, and had he been able to have attacked in April, um, long before the, uh, the, the Russian winter, um, he could well have knocked the Soviet Union out of the war, pushed them back to the Urals. As it was on the 18th of October 1941, Stalin made his personal train ready to take him back to Yekaterinburg. Had that happened... The, the Nazis would have commanded everywhere from the Urals all the way to Brest and Cherbourg and, uh, and the uh, North Sea. And it would have been utterly catastrophic for, um, for certainly the United Kingdom 
and also Holland, of course, but for civilization in general. Yes. Keep it short, please. Yes. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll hold it for Thank you. you. Uh, your remarks on the blunders that Churchill made uh, induces me to share with you a Dutch poem which basically comes down to the point that if you cannot make blunders, you won't be able to perform miracles either. That's wonderful, because <laughs> almost exactly the same remarks that he made about his own... Uh, he, he made to his own wife, Clementine, on, in January 1916, writing from the trenches, saying, if I had not made mistakes, I would not have been able to have made anything. The question that I would like to pose, since we're talking about the lessons from Churchill for today's Europe, is whether you could imagine that Churchill would ever have had compared the present European Union, which at the time of the British accession was described as an organization of democratic states, whether Churchill would ever have dared to describe that as a Fourth Reich, as a reinvention of Hitler. No, of course not. Like another pseudo-biographer uh, of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Churchill is doing at the moment. Who's that? Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Oh, I see, yes, completely absurd. Not, not the only absurd thing that Boris has said, I hate him to add. He's also one of the great uh, uh, misusers of Winston Churchill. He was one of the, the eloquent uh, people on the vote leave side who argued for leave using Winston Churchill as his historical justification for his argument. Uh, so. Yes, I think, it's, I think it's, uh, it's terrible, don't you, ever to use Winston Churchill? No, one. For, uh, <laughs> never. <laughs> I'm Paul. I have a question for you, Andrew. There's something I don't quite understand, namely the reason why was Churchill not an advocate, not an active advocate for uh, uh, England participating to the European Union or the Commonwealth of Europe, for my part. Why was that? Um, it was two things, really. Um, the first was that he thought that it would damage the special relationship that uh, Britain had with the United States. Uh, a, a remark, of course, the, the, a phrase that he himself invented in his, uh, in his uh, Harvard speech in September 1943. And also, he thought that it would damage... Uh, Britain's relationship, certainly a trading relationship, with the rest of the British Commonwealth, the, um, with uh, places like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and so he, he felt that although we had geographically a great deal in common with uh, Europe, in terms of our, of our blood, of our kith and kin, that was much closer to c the Commonwealth. And in terms of law and la language and so on, we were close to the United States. And so he didn't want to sacrifice any of that. Um, he thought that we would be able to get the best of both worlds and stay in the centre of this sort of concentric circle that uh, Felix rightly mentioned earlier. He did not sacrifice it. want to sacrifice it. Exactly. Yes, but, um, but ultimately, if we were to be involved too closely, if we were to get too closely involved in Europe, it would, of course, damage our relations with uh, both the Commonwealth, as it did, of course, in trading relations, um, and also the, uh, the US. Um, well, and, and, and trade, actually, as well. Last question, I guess, from the audience. Anyone else? No, then this is the last one for you. Wow. <laughs> My name is Susanna de Sitter. I am a child of an English mother and a Dutch father. And my mother always, uh, in living in Holland, voted Churchill, <laughs> even <laughs> as all the other parties, Dutch parties, were on, uh, on the piece of paper. Um, there are two things I would like to say and ask. Uh, one is, you were saying, uh, Mr. Roberts, that um, to win the peace, Europe had to be united. And that's words uh, by Winston Churchill himself. Um, I find it always so interesting if British people are talking about Europe and they are talking about Europe in two senses. In one way, they talk about Europe as if they are part of it and 
In the same sentence or in the same meaning, they can be outside of it. So how can a man who says Europe has to be united be the same person thinking, of course they have to be united, but not with us in it? That's my first question. <laughs> and my other question is, short, <laughs> it combines Felix Kloss and your remarks, this first remark at Europe being united and Felix uh, very uh, well phrasing our feeling of living under an umbrella since the Second World War. Many people don't realize how strong this umbrella is and I believe very strongly that's the combination of NATO and the EU, which is actually, in my feeling, um, uh, you can see what's happening with the influence that Russia is trying to do in the EU by trying to influence the Brexit uh, referendum and also on the other so side of NATO. And now please come to your question, otherwise we have another biography okay. of the European <laughs> Union here. Well, anyhow, um, I believe it's a combination of the two. Do you believe that as well? And did Winston believe that? Yes, I think that, um, that uh, Churchill was perfectly capable because he was speaking as a world historical figure who was somebody who had been recognized by all as being epicentral to the victory in the Second World War, was therefore absolutely capable of, um, of saying that Europe should unite. He was a Francophile all his life. He was somebody who had lost so many friends in the First World War and Second World War that he was perfectly capable of saying that Europe should unite without trying to uh, take his own country into that in that, into that uh, unity. I mean, you look at all of the American presidents from FDR through to about um, to beyond Bill Clinton, they were also in favor of European unity, but they weren't um, asking that the United States should join. So, um, so it's perfectly possible for a statesman to be in favor of something that he didn't want his own country to be part of. And your second question, um, which I've now completely forgotten, apologies. Oh, yes, about the Russian influence. Yes, if you really, truly believe that, um, that Vladimir Putin is the reason that 17,410,742 um, uh, people voted for Brexit in, uh, in June 2016, I'm afraid you're barking up the wrong tree. Felix, you wanted to give one last remark, and let me yeah. please uh, ask you to combine it with my final question to you being, when you're running up uh, for the European elections, what is it, what lesson of Churchill do you take with you? Maybe you could right. intertwine I'll, the two. I'll try, I'll try to intertwine the two. Yeah. Thanks. What I wanted to say is, um, Winston Churchill, a China, child of the 19th century, saw three great wars in his life, I think. First was the Franco-German War, the second was the First World War, and the third was the Second World War. After the Second World War, he was at the head of an organization, the founder of the United Europe Movement, the founder of the European Movement, the great founder of the Congress of Europe, which was the beginning uh, of any idea of European unity. He was part of the first crop of European parliamentarians gathering at the Council of Europe in Strasbourg in 1950. He was the originator of the idea of a European army. And he was the great protagonist of the idea of having the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg, which would protect individuals against the fundamental anti-democratic sentiments that had led to the wars uh, uh, that he fought in. I think it is completely right to say that today we're living in a Europe which is mostly the legacy of Winston Churchill, more united than ever before, after 70 years of peace, more prosperous than we've ever seen in human history. And it is a great tragedy that our British friends and brothers are leaving the organization which he helped to set up and which his children and uh, his uh, uh, great progressive friends in arms uh, helped build in these past 40 years. Uh, so I think it's a tragedy. The lesson I take from this is that Winston Churchill was a romantic. He had big ideas for democracy, for liberty, uh, and he had uh, a big visions for the future. I want our politicians to have big visions for the future. Uh, not bother about koopkrachtplaatjes uh, or technocratic management uh, uh, of the state. I want them to think further than tomorrow, and that's the one great thing that we can learn from Winston Churchill. Uh, sorry? From your side or for Mr. Roberts? 
well, then I suggest critique from your side. We'll save it for the bar. Do it directly, just because we, we can have we can have a beer if you want. I would like that. Just because we're kind of ending yeah. the program. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Point being, uh, Churchill didn't play a role in structuring the organisation's things. We heard that, and now I'm going to close this discussion between the two of you. Um, Churchill, you've just been. Uh, presenting him to us as a romantic, you've also told us that he was a crybaby sometimes. <laughs> but please, Mr. Roberts, you can't leave us here tonight with this image of Mr. Churchill just crying at the current situation in Europe. So no, no, of give course us not. No, 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 no. And many of his tears were not tears, not tears of uh, ever tears of self-pity. They were tears of despair. They were tears of rage. They were tears of uh, of pride uh, on occasion as well. When uh, there were great march pasts, uh, especially during the Second World War. No, he was somebody who wore his, his heart on his sleeve, who was passionate about, uh, about things. He, was a th he wasn't the buttoned-up Victorian aristocrat uh, at all. He was a throwback to an earlier era. He was an early 19th century romantic figure um, who, uh, who wore his heart on his sleeve. And it was because he was such a passionate figure that, he was, that we can be certain that if he had wanted to join the... Um, the uh, European project, let alone the European project that today is totally different from the European project that, um, that Britain tried to join in 1961 and did join in 1973, which has now become a uh, attempted European superstate, which would have shocked uh, him and, uh, and I think disgusted him. Nonetheless, one of the things that, uh, that Felix said is absolutely essential, and this is why I'm looking forward to Felix being in the European Parliament uh, after the next elections, uh, because he is a passionate supporter of democracy. And what we have discovered on the 23rd of June uh, 2016 is that 51.86% of people, of Britons, i.e. the majority of people who voted in that uh, referendum wanted to leave the European Union. And at the moment, we have a majority for that amongst the people, and in Parliament, 74% of people, of MPs, want to stop that from happening. So it will be stopped from happening. One way or another, either we will have some kind of a botched agreement that will keep us in the European Union, or we will have, be part of a customs union, and the European Union is a customs union, and therefore it will be a betrayal of the vote of the majority, which in a democratic country is absolutely outrageous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew Roberts, and thank you, Felix Schloss. Thank you for being here. Thank you very the much. bar is open. Thank you.